Hey, kiddos. Well, you know, normally I would tell you Shabbat Shalom, but where I'm at right now, it's not Sabbath yet. But I guess by the time you watch this, it will be Sabbath. So I can say it. Shabbat Shalom. <sighs> I'm doing something right now that's both exciting and frustrating at the same time. It's exciting because Miss Ashley made me a promise. She promised to make me some homemade cookies. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Do you like cookies? What's your favorite kind? Mmm, that sounds good. My favorite kind is chocolate chip. Ooh, I love chocolate chip cookies. I like a chocolate chip cookie that's about this big. And I've got a secret. What I do is I take the chocolate chip cookie and I flip it over like this. And then I go and get some vanilla bean ice cream and I stick it on top. And then I do it again. <laughs> then I take my other cookie and I stick it on top and make a sandwich. But you gotta be careful because whenever you go, if you're not careful, the ice cream will go out the side. And so what you gotta do is, is you squeeze and you take your finger or your tongue and you wipe it around the outside to make sure that it doesn't go all over you. And you take it, oh, so good. I love it. So I'm excited about the promise that Miss Ashley made me about making me homemade cookies. But you know what? She didn't tell me what kind of cookie it was gonna be. And I've gotta wait for her to make them. I hate waiting. Oh, I hate waiting. You like waiting on things? No, me either. I wonder if there's anything I can do to help speed the process along. You know, could I make any suggestions to Miss Ashley's recipe to see if it'll make the cookies cook faster? What's well, some things that cook real fast? Chicken nuggets cook real fast. You think if we put chicken nuggets in there, it, that'd it be good cookies? Yeah, I don't think so. Chicken nugget cookies wouldn't be good. What if we put popcorn in there? Popcorn cooks really fast. Do you think that would be good? No, I don't think popcorn cookies would be good either. Hmm. I guess I'm really gonna have to think about this because I've gotta wait on the promise that Miss Ashley made and I have to wait for everything to go on her time. You know, it kind of reminds me of what our Sabbath school is gonna be about right now, where Yahweh made Abraham a promise and he had to wait on it to come true. Hmm. I think they tried to mess with Yahweh's recipe too in getting things done. Tell you what, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna keep waiting on Miss Ashley to make the cookies. And uh, let's get Sabbath school started. We'll start out with prayer, we'll hear our story, and then we'll get on into it. I'll come back to you here in a little bit and let you know what's going on with the cookies. See ya. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've made, and we thank you for another Shabbat. We thank you for everyone that is here watching and all of the teachers. We pray your blessings would be on each and every one in a special way and that your presence would be with us. May we honor you and please you in all our ways. In Yeshua's name, amen. Shabbat Shalom. This is another new song and it is about, it's based on the story that you're going to learn today about Sarah and Hagar. And it goes like this. said to her husband, I don't think that I can give you a son. It's been too long, but I have an idea. If you want to try, you can have my maid. I don't think it's wrong. So he agreed to try it her way. So they could be a mother and father. This is what happens. 
things when you do your own thing instead of waiting on ya, waiting on ya. This is what happens when you try your own way. It doesn't work very well, work very well. This is what happens when you do your own thing instead of waiting on ya, waiting on ya. This is what happens when you try your own way. It doesn't work very well, work very well at all. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, boys and girls. This is Miss Megan, and I'm excited to be here with you today. Last week, we learned that Yahweh had made a covenant with Abram to make his offspring outnumber all the stars in the sky, and that they would come to reside in this great piece of land that he had outlined for Abram. But Abram and his wife were really old, past childbearing years, and they hadn't had any children of their own. So, how can that be? Well, let's see what happens next. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, Yahweh has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So, after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Aram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May Yahweh judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of Yahweh found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of Yahweh said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of Yahweh also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of Yahweh said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, You are an El of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Barib. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was eighty-six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Hmm. This isn't the easiest story to listen to, but there's one really important thing I want you to understand about this story. We have to trust Yahweh's perfect timing, even when we don't understand why or how things will happen. Do you see what happens when we are impatient and take matters into our own hands? Last week we learned that Yahweh had promised Abram that he would give him more offspring than all the stars in the sky. Because he and Sarai were so old, they grew impatient and decided to try to rush Yahweh's plan. But that didn't go over so well, did it? Can you think of a time where you were impatient and didn't wait on Yahweh? Waiting on something we really want can be challenging, but His ways and timing are perfect, and we have to learn to trust and obey Him, even when it's really, really hard. After all, blessings always come out of obedience. Well, I can't wait to learn what happens with Abram and Sarai next week. Shalom! Interesting Facts About Fetal Development Life begins for all of us at conception. We all start out as a single cell, 
too small to be seen by the eye, and grow into a baby. In the Bible it says, For you, you possess my kidneys, you have covered me in my mother's womb. Psalms 139.13 Yah is the creator of life, and in the early weeks so many amazing things happen while we are forming. Here are just a few of the many interesting facts about a baby being formed in the womb. When the seed fertilizes the egg, it's called conception, and at that point it has its very own DNA unique from the father and the mother. By day 18, a baby has a heartbeat, and it can be seen beating on ultrasound at 6 weeks. Between weeks 7 and 10, a baby has developed all the body parts he or she will be born with, even though they are only about an inch long. By week 14, a baby is the size of a pomegranate, and by week 40, the size of a watermelon. By the fourth month, the baby can suck on its fingers and toes and play with its umbilical cord. The lungs are the last major organ of the baby to develop, usually around 34 weeks, which explains why babies born early need oxygen and other medical interventions. The first breath of a newborn is extremely important because it expands the fluid-filled lungs with oxygen and moves oxygen into the bloodstream. Yah created us all in His image. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalms 139.14 Shalom! Wasn't that a very interesting story? I mean, Abraham and Sarah didn't wait on Yahweh's timing. You know, Yahweh has a recipe about life, and they didn't wait. It actually caused some hardship there because Hagar and Sarah started not being able to act well with one another, and, you know, it caused a lot of heartache. So I wonder if I should mess with the, the recipe. We don't want any chicken nuggets. We don't want any popcorn in there. We already figured that out. But maybe what we could do, because I really, really want some cookies and I want them fast, is maybe instead of making them the size that the recipe says, what if we put it a little bit thinner so that they cook faster? Hmm. Let's watch and see if that works. Well, the good news is, I have cookies. At least I think that's what this is. You know, I'm used to cookies being a lot bigger. It smells like a cookie. I'm sure it's gonna taste like a cookie. But you know, I'm gonna have a real hard time getting one of vanilla bean ice cream. I'm definitely not getting a second of ice cream on here. I guess I should have did what the recipe said. I should have just waited. Then I would have had a big cookie, like I'm used to, and could have put the ice cream on top of it. Things would have been a lot better had I just waited and did what I was supposed to, don't you think? I wonder if that's what Abraham and Sarah and Hagar felt like. You know, if they had just waited and did what Yahweh said, waited on his timing, things probably would have turned out better, don't you think? think so. All right, well, let's get on to our next segment. We're going to go and have our Hebrew. We're going to have our history and our moral, and I'll see you here in just a little bit. Sadiq. 
Shalom. Hello, boys and girls. In today's Hebrew lesson, we will learn seven words that are found throughout chapter 16 in the book of Genesis. That's Bereshit in Hebrew. Are you ready to learn some new Hebrew words? Great, then let's go. The first word we see is the Hebrew word for children. It's Yeladim. These Yeladim look pretty happy, right? We see the Hebrew letters of Yud, Lamed, Dalet, Yud, and final Mem. Together, they spell Yeladim. The second word we see is the Hebrew word for pregnant, Hara. That mommy is pregnant with a little baby. Hara is made up of the Hebrew letters He, Resh, and He. And together they spell Hara. The third word we see is the Hebrew word for Egypt, Mitzraim. Hagar was an Egyptian woman because she lived in Egypt. Mitzraim is made up of the letters Mem, Tzadi, Resh, Yud, and final Mem. Together they spell Mitzraim. The fourth word we see is the Hebrew word for eyes, Ayanim. Everyone has different colored eyes. What color are your eyes? Ayanim is made up of the Hebrew letters Ein, Yud, Nun, Yud, Yud, and final Mem. Put them together and they spell Ayanim. The fifth word we see is the Hebrew word for hand, Yad. We use our hands to do many things, and using our hands to help others is one of the best ways to use them. The word for hand is spelled using the letters Yud and Dalit. Put them together and you get Yad. The sixth word we see is the Hebrew word for well, Ba'er. People use wells to get water from in places like the desert or out in the country. Ba'er is made up of the Hebrew letters Bit, Aleph, and Rish. Together, they spell Ba'er. The seventh and final word for today is Shema, and it's the Hebrew word for hear or listen. We use our ears in order to hear sounds. We need to use our ears in order to listen and obey what our parents tell us. This word is made up of the Hebrew letters Shin, Mem, and Ein. Together, they spell Shema. Good job, boys and girls. I hope you had fun learning some new Hebrew words. Shabbat Shalom. It's Miss Jessica here for today's history lesson. This week, we see that Hagar ran away. When she ran away, a messenger of Yah found her beside a spring. The definition of a spring is a place where water wells up from an underground source. There are lots of places in scripture that talk about these types of places sometimes called a well or cistern. These wells or cisterns were sometimes fed by springs. Others were dug deep underground until they reached or went below something called the water table. 
Let's take a quick look at how that works. A hole would be dug deep into the ground until they reached the area underground that was saturated with water. And poof, you have a well. Cisterns were used to supply drinking water for humans and animals. Oftentimes, rivers, brooks, and lakes were used as sources of water for such needs too, if they were nearby. Cisterns, however, were man-made, and they weren't already here when y'all created the earth. Usually, the water was drawn up by a rope that ran over a wheel, and a bucket made of animal skins was fastened to the rope. Then, it would be lowered to gather water and pulled back up. It took hard work to create a cistern, and it took hard work to fetch large amounts of water, too. Many houses in rural areas still use wells today to supply their homes with water. Do you know anyone that uses well water? I do. My grandmother used it for many, many years in her home. And my great-grandparents used it as well, but they used it just like they did in the days of Scripture. They had to go fetch water at the well itself. It wasn't plumb to pump into their home through pipes like my grandmother's house was. So if you needed a drink of water, you had to go get it from the well. They had to go outside regardless of the weather to get fresh water for taking a bath, for cooking, anything that you needed it for. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you had to fetch water from a cistern? Sometimes we don't always stop to appreciate things that make our lives easier. Having clean running water is one of those things that can sometimes slip our minds when we're thanking Yahweh for all of our wonderful blessings. Not everyone has access to clean water. So if you have clean water to drink, bathe in, cook with, be sure to say thank you to Abba Yah for such a wonderful blessing. Until next time, Shabbat Shalom Mahavarim. Shalom, this is Miss Megan, and I'm back to talk with you about something pretty important. Do you know what patience is? You do? Great! Well, I want to tell you a story about a boy named Zach who learned the hard way about what that word truly means. So, there once was a teacher named Mr. Johnson who had given his students some sunflower seeds. Each kid was responsible for planting and caring for their own sunflower until it was time to harvest the seeds. Zach, a boy in Mr. Johnson's class, was so excited for his plant to be ready. Sunflower seeds were his absolute favorite snack and he couldn't wait for his sunflower to be big enough. The kids each planted their seeds in cups and looked after them each day, making sure that they had enough water and sunlight to grow. After what felt like forever, the first tiny green sunflower shoot finally appeared. Zack was overjoyed, and filled with impatience, he ran over to Mr. Johnson, excitedly asking him if he could uproot the plant to retrieve its seeds yet. Mr. Johnson reminded Zack that every plant blooms in its own time, and that he would have to be patient and continue to care for his sunflower until it was the perfect time. Zack was disappointed by this answer but he continued to take great care of his sunflower. Days and weeks passed, and as the little sunflower continued to grow, so did Zach's impatience. Finally, as he was caring for his sunflower one day, he noticed its first seeds, and he immediately ran over to Mr. Johnson, telling him that it was time to harvest the seeds. Mr. Johnson told Zach yet again that it wasn't quite time, and that he needed to be patient just a little while longer. Zack decided that he knew better than his teacher, and that he would take matters into his own hands, so he snipped off his sunflower and tried to harvest the seeds. Now if you know anything about plants, you'll know that once you cut it, it no longer grows and matures, and there is no reattaching. There is no undoing it once the plant is cut, which is why it is important to be patient until the plant is truly ready to harvest. Zack quickly found this out. Once he cut off the sunflower, he saw that the seeds were nowhere near ripe enough to eat, and he was devastated. He had put in so much effort into caring for his little sunflower, but he quickly gave it all up because of his impatience. It was not time for his sunflower to be harvested, 
And had he waited patiently on it to become ripe in its own time, he would have been able to eat his favorite snack in the end. Have you ever been asked to wait for something you really wanted? Maybe you had to wait in line to ride your favorite ride at the amusement park on the busiest day of the year. Or maybe it was for a special Shabbat dessert after dinner that your mom rarely ever makes. Have you ever been told there was a surprise for you? And then your friend who was surprising you told you early instead of waiting on you to see for yourself? You still got the gift, but when it came time for it, I'm sure it wasn't as much fun had it been kept a surprise. You may have even been a little disappointed that your friend didn't wait and ruin the surprise for you. Waiting will always be a part of everyday life, and there's just no avoiding it. You'll wait at stoplights, in line at the grocery store, or to swing at the playground when all the seats are full. Sometimes the challenge of waiting is harder, like when you're sick and can't play with your friends until you are feeling better. There even will be times in your life when Yahweh tells you to wait, though these times will occur more often as you get older. You may not understand why or even agree with Him telling you to wait on what you are asking for, but we know that His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, so He knows what is best for us. Just like with Zach's sunflower, Yahweh times everything perfectly. From the rising and setting of the sun, to the leaves changing color and falling to the ground, or how babies are formed by his hands in their mother's womb and are born when they are perfect in his sight, his timing is always right. Because waiting is something we do so often, it's no wonder patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Being patient means to accept the fact that something may take longer than you might have thought. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no Torah. Verse 25 also tells us that if we live in the Spirit, we should also be walking in the Spirit. That means that our friends should be able to look at us and see our fruits that we are loving, trustworthy, kind, and patient, just to name a few. Do you struggle with being patient like Zach did in our story? This week, pray and ask Yahweh to help you learn to wait patiently, even when it's really, really hard. After all, you can do all things with Yahweh. Until next time, Shalom! Hey, what's up kiddos? I mean, we've been learning a lot of great stuff today. I mean, it's been awesome. I don't know about you, though. With all that great information, I'm feeling like I need to get up and move around. So much so that I went in there and changed my clothes. So, I'd like to invite you to get up and move around with me. We're going to start doing something that I'm going to call the seventh day stretch. I got it from the idea of what they do in baseball where the seventh inning, they do the seventh inning stretch where they get up and move around and make sure they're limber. So, what I want you to do is... Get up. You might have to move some stuff in the living room because we're going to get in the floor to be able to do what we're going to do. But push that stuff out of the way. Hit pause, obviously. And then come back to me when you're ready and we'll get ready to go. Okay? All right. Let's get started. Every stretch we're going to do today is going to have something to do with cookies. I know. I've got cookies on the brain. But it's just where we're at. So the very first thing I want you to do is I want you to get on your knees like this. I want you to take it, I want you to put your arms up straight into the sky and trace the biggest cookie that you've ever seen in your entire life. Oh, you should feel this stretch right here in your back. Let's do it again, let's stretch. I'm talking about big cookies. Oh, I like big cookies. All right, next thing we're gonna do is, is we're gonna pretend we've got a cookie on this side and a cookie on this side. And we're gonna sit there and we're gonna do arm circles. Oh, I wish I had a cookie that big. Man, if I had a cookie that big, I'd take it, I'd put some ice cream on it, and it would be fantastic. Okay, let's try and go back around. Oh, I love cookies. All right, now the next thing we're gonna do is, it's called huggers. And what huggers are, you can get down on your knees, and you're gonna sit there and you're gonna do like this. And you're gonna hug yourself. And what I want you to think about is, is when mommy makes you cookies, don't you go over and give her a big hug. Oh, I love cookies. Thank 
you want me? Bring me cookies. <laughs> All right. The next one we're going to do is going to be called table because where do you find cookies? You find them on the table. So what I want you to do is, I want you to take and put your feet on the ground like this. And I want you to put your hands pointing with your fingers back this way on both sides. And I want you to lift your hips up and make yourself into a flat table. And I want you to just take and put your little hand back like this. And breathe in and think, oh, I like cookies. I like cookies. Oh. All right, let's sit down. Next stretch we're going to do is called cobbler stretch. Now, cobblers, I think the reason why they call it cobblers is because you put your feet like this, and cobblers just make shoes. But when I think of cobbler, I think of pie. When I think of pie, I think of sweet things baked in the oven, you know, like cookies. All right, so take, put your feet together like this and put them on the ground. Now your knees may be up here. If they're up here, take your elbows and push them down like this. And you should get a nice stretch on the inside of your leg. All right. Now, after you get down, you know, my legs go pretty low. I want you to think about making yourself into a hinge. I want you to bring your leg forward like this. And I want you to take a deep breath in. And think, if I had a cookie in front of me, I'd eat it. Do it again. Cookie in front of me, I'd eat it. Oh. All right. The last stretch is going to get the back side of your legs. I want you to take your first foot, I want you to stick it out, I want you to put your toes up in the air. All right, you're gonna take this leg, stick it on the inside, make sure you got a good triangle right here. I want you to take one hand and either put it on your toe or put it on your shin, depending on how tight the back of your leg is. You'll know which one you need to do. All right, so I'm gonna put my hand right here. Then I'm gonna take and pretend like I got a cookie in this hand and there's a glass of milk at the bottom of my foot. And I'm gonna take this cookie and I'm gonna stick it in the milk. You should feel a stretch on the back side of your leg. All right, let's do it again. Grab the cookie from behind us. One more time. Grab the cookie. All right, let's switch legs. We're gonna take the other leg, stick it out, point our toes into the air. Make sure we got this leg right here in the corner, at a triangle. Take your hand, put it on either your shin or your foot. Grab the cookie behind you and go. One more time, grab that cookie. Three times, let's do it. Grab the cookie. All right, we should be all limber. We should be good to go now. And let's get on. We've got our song, we've got a memory verse, and we've got our craft left to do, and then we'll get prayed out. Father, we thank you that you see us, you know us, and you love us.
Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is Ms. Shannon with another passage of scripture to memorize. This week we learned about Sarah and Hagar and how a sort of messy situation ensued because people were trying to do things according to their own understanding. So that's why I chose the memory verse for this week to be Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Let's take a look at it. Trust in Yah with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Alright, so now let's try a little memorization. I'll say a piece of the verse, and you can repeat after me. Ready? Here we go. Trust in Yah. With all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Great job! I really love this scripture. It's been a big blessing in my life, and I hope it is in yours. Let's go ahead and read it one more time. Trust in Yah with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5-6 through six. Keep on working on this verse as much as you need. Well, that's all for now. Have a good week, and Shabbat Shalom! Hey guys, and welcome back to this week's Trained Up in Torah. I'm back with you again this week to do another craft. I'm Ashley, and this week in our scripture study, we learned a little bit about what went on between Hagar and Sarah, and how they weren't really happy with each other. So Hagar ended up at that well, and the messenger had a lot to say to her. So I thought this week that a craft would be fun if we did some kind of well. So today, that's exactly what we're going to do. So grab your chair, grab your craft stuff, and let's have fun.
Hey, for today's snack idea, how about we make the same cookies that Miss Ashley made? You'll need butter, sugar, and all-purpose flour. You can have vanilla sprinkles, optional. And Miss Ashley added an egg to the recipe. We have a link in the description that takes you straight to the recipe Ashley was following when she made these same cookies. Now, if you'd like, you could use chocolate chips and peanut butter or some other nut butter and decorate your cookies to look like a donkey. Because Ishmael was going to be like a wild donkey of a man. You could also stir in some nuts and seeds into your cookie batter to represent Abraham's seed being as numerous as the stars. Or if you don't have any of these ingredients, you could eat a watermelon, which is filled with seeds. If this recipe doesn't work for your diet restrictions, you could experiment and change it out for a gluten-free flour and change out the sugar for some honey or maple syrup or anything else that you're able to use. Hey, you can share your pictures of your creations on Facebook. We'd love to see it. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed your craft and your snack, and I hope you've learned tons today. I know I have, and I'm so thankful for the people that we learned about, the lesson that they went through, and the fact that we get to learn from it and go forward with it in our own lives. We get to trust that the Father is the giver of life, and we get to just uphold that and give that to Him in, in trust and obedience in our hearts. Let's go ahead and close out in prayer, and um, I will pray for us, and then we can go ahead and get back to our Shabbat. <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody who is working and trained up in Torah. I, I thank you for the little ones that are watching, that are learning, and that are loving on you just as much as we are, Father. I pray for them to walk in obedience with you. I thank you for what you did um, with Hagar and Sarah, Father. I thank you that you, you taught Sarah how to work through something that she had made. She made a mistake and it felt like a crash and burn, but it wasn't. You redeemed it and you gave her life. I thank you for the son that you've given to them. And I thank you for all the babies that have come after that, Father. I thank you that you give life. And I pray that you would just give all of us so much life this week. Give us your spirit. Give us the fruit. Show us the way and just allow us to indulge in your presence, Father. I thank you so much. And I just ask that you would bless each and every single one of the people that are watching today, um, especially the little ones, Father, reveal yourself to them. And I just thank you so much in your son's name. Amen. All right, you guys have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and I'll see you next time. Bye.